Well, good evening and uh, welcome, uh, welcome from rainy Adelaide. Uh, tonight's presentation uh, was actually organised by the New South Wales uh, RENA section, but of course the speaker for this evening's presentation is based in Adelaide, uh, so we were delighted to be able to host Eric and his presentation uh, on behalf of the New South Wales section. So I'd just like to read the acknowledgement of country. Um, so uh, we, uh, we the Rena would like to pay our respects to the Karuna people, the traditional custodians whose ancestral lands we gather on. We acknowledge the deep feelings and attachment and relationship of the Karuna people to country, and we expect their past, present, and ongoing connections to the land and cultural beliefs. Um, please make sure you've got your telephones turned off. That's all relevant to the uh, to the uh, team here. A couple of announcements for this evening. So the New South Wales section have asked uh, uh, me to remind uh, the, the meeting that the Indo-Pacific uh, 2023 takes place on the 7th to the 9th of November at the International Conference Centre in Sydney. Uh, get your date in a diary and uh, make sure that you're there. I'm sure it's going to be a very exciting uh, uh, Indo-Pacific this year. In terms of uh, RENA South Australia section, uh, there is no technical presentation. We normally have our technical presentations uh, the third Wednesday in each month. There is no technical presentation uh, this month. We have another engagement. Uh, the next presentation will be the third week in July. Uh, further details um, to be announced. We are going to be undertaking the um, uh, AGM for the uh, SA and NT section immediately prior to the uh, meeting. Okay, with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Eric Fusel, who is the program director. Um, of marine engineering at the University of Adelaide. I've known Eric now for about 10, um, 11 years. Um, I always love listening to uh, Eric. He always does some really fantastic presentations. If you haven't met Eric before, so um, Eric has dedicated 25 years of his professional life to the submarine industry. Uh, a true submarine deep expert in my experience, covering the full spectrum of the both boat life cycle, design, build, test, activation, and sustainment activities. And that is worldwide. So he's got experience in the USA, France, and more lately for the last 12 years in Australia. 10, um, yeah, 11, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Eric's one of those unique uh, individuals who um, has done one and a half thousand hours on sea trials commissioning nuclear powered submarines so he'll make himself very very popular um, over the coming uh, August scope of work. So he's worked on the Barracuda submarine the Suffering class up to successful systems design completion. So Eric joined AC in 2013 and this is when I met Eric uh, and left in 2018 to pursue his career um, at the University of Adelaide. But anyway, I won't, I won't hold Eric back any longer. He's keen to go. Do you want to share your screen, Eric? I'll share my screen. Away. Thank you, Phil, for the kind introduction. Uh, I think that you are too kind with me, uh, but uh, I'll take these. Okay, I should be now sharing my screen. Uh, please uh, let me know if you uh, can see my screen perfectly and if there is any uh, any issue. Okay, let's take a deep dive into the um, Australian Future Submarine the Multiverse. So this presentation, some of you have already seen some bits of it um, when I presented it at the Submarine Institute of Australia conference. Uh, last year, but since then a lot of things have happened. Uh, we've had the release of the defense strategic review and uh, a few snippets of uh, one of the possible future for um, the Australian future summary. So let's have a look. 
Before that, uh, a few a few caveats. Um, I'm trying to bring a factual approach, but a lot of what I'm doing is also based on on research and trying to forecast what we will have in um, in the future. So please see that as a kind of sanity check. I want it to be thought provoking, to be eye opening, and a bit diverse. So coming from a different angle than uh, the uh, usual chest banging that we are so fond of in uh, Australia. The idea is to make sure that we shed light into every dark corner so that we are not uh, online. If you can just mute your microphones, that will be nice for everyone. Thank you. Uh, what about me? Phil has, do uh, has done a, a brilliant introduction, uh, so I'm not going to uh, repeat everything. Uh, just a bit of uh, submarine porn uh, for everyone uh, on board. So these are the different submarines I had some intimate connections uh, with. Uh, you may uh, recognize a, a few of them uh, from France, Australia, uh, even from uh, some dodgy countries in the bottom left uh, corner. Uh, there will be a quiz at the end if you want to, to have some, some fun. Uh, the, uh, and by the way, uh, Mr. Phil Bevan, the top left one is the one that bumped into the British uh, submarine because you were driving on the wrong side, the wrong side. of the road. Completely so, no offense. Um, so, because we're talking about a, a multiverse, we've got some denizens in that multiverse. And all of these have some perspective on the future submarine. So, let's start with the big wings. At the top, we've got our great uh, and unique Australian uh, politicians, uh, either with international um, uh, or domestic uh, perspective, and they all had or they all have a say in uh, in defence. Because unfortunately, in Australia, defence is a bloody political football, and um, that does not help us. Then below these guys, uh, we've got still above the line, the ones that are trying to put some grease uh, in, into the machine so that uh, it, it's, it is uh, working. So you will recognize um, um, Andrew Van Mead, who is in charge of the uh, nuclear submarine program, but also uh, figures and faces from, uh, from the past, either from Australia, uh, when Warren Moffitt started the, the program, or from overseas, uh, from UK and in uh, the US. Uh, just to mention uh, Admiral Summit, uh, and uh, to mention that when he was uh, in charge, it was up to the attack class program. And since uh, the announcement of AUKUS, uh, unfortunately, he is no longer a part of the uh, enterprise. And what baffles me is that no one in the media or in the community has basically um, expressed uh, a surprise about why this great guy, uh, and I'm, I'm very serious about that, with uh, a commitment to the Australian sovereign submarine capability is no longer in the process. So that's, that was not a good sign. And I don't think it was a mark of respect uh, towards a Greg summit, and I like it to be said. Now, below the line, uh, this is where most of us are or where we've got uh, the defense um, industry, we've got uh, the shipbuilders, we've got the suppliers, we've got all these entities that are trying to support the industrial capability. Uh, you, name, you name it, uh, Defense Training Center, ICN, AIDN, et cetera, et cetera. They are all trying to support the capability. Uh, even us within the uh, academic world, we are not all boffins. Uh, some of us have seen real life in industry and we are trying to educate or contaminate the students to basically show them that there are some perspectives in the shipbuilding industry. That's important because a lot of my students, they want to go into aerospace, but I'd like a lot of them to go into shipbuilding because that's where we need uh, not bums on seats, but actually bright minds to um, support the enterprise. And now below the line, we've got a bit of everything. Uh, we've got the press, the media, the think tanks, 
uh, the social media, LinkedIn, uh, guys on YouTube, and they all express an opinion. So basically, all these ones are talking about submarines. They all have their own stance, and it's really hard to separate the wheat from the chaff. Why? Because basically, when you look at these guys, it's impossible to speak one voice. Okay, some of them have the capability to be heard um, from afar. You know, they got high, high exposure. Can you just make sure that you mute your microphones when online, please? Um, some of these uh, speakers can speak very loudly, but are they the ones that truly know the business? Okay. And on the other hand, people that does know what the business is, the submarine industry is, or the submarine capability, or how to use submarine, they are not necessarily free to talk or not necessarily have the overall reach into the community to get heard. So those with uh, the loudest voice are the politicians, people in the media, but basically they sometimes, especially our politicians, they've got their own personal agenda that may not align with, uh, and it's sad to be said, but that may not align with uh, Australia's best interest. The life expectancy of a politician is very short compared to a submarine program, and that in itself doesn't help because where is the accountability in the end? Not with our politicians. Defense and government agencies, they are accountable, but basically they cannot voice their opinion because they have uh, basically to remain um, silent and discreet on what is to happen. In industry and um, the academic world or think tanks, uh, well, we can voice our opinion, but basically we have little leverage on what uh, the decisions can be. And with the media, you can shout and say things very loud, but basically what is your actual level of expertise? What is your life expectancy with regards to submarine programs? And good news don't sell. So that's not basically um, easy to speak one voice. It's basically an impossible mission. So let's try to separate a bit the wheat from the chaff into this. And uh, let's delve into AUKUS in the short, middle, and uh, long term to try to understand what could be happening. We all know AUKUS was announced in uh, September 2021 by Scott Morrison with um, an ambition to bring Australia uh, with uh, the big brothers from the US and, free and, and the UK to have a strategic importance uh, backed up by uh, quantum technologies, artificial intelligence, and the iconic assets that are nuclear powered submarines. Those same nuclear powered submarines that we had basically pledged to never have because that was not in, in the plan. And in one day, that happened. And in one day, that happened without having the GM subs being uh, involved into the decision making process. That is remarkable. Why? Because basically what we say is that uh, the geopolitical context has changed drastically in the recent times and the conventional submarines are not the best solution for that. What does that mean? Obviously that's China growing influence in the South um, East Pacific and uh, a bit further that could pull some threats to uh, basically the goods that are coming to or from Australia that do represent 90% of uh, the shipping by uh, sea for these goods. And uh, those threats in terms of assets that China could throw at us uh, have basically been multiplied by five in terms of Navy assets in the past 20 years and by 14 in terms of aircrafts uh, since 2001. You could say that it's not sudden because you can see on the top, sorry, on the bottom left, uh, that uh, the this, this slope has a kind of regular um, step uh, in terms of increase, but uh, that has become very uh, prominent in, in, the recent, uh, in the recent years. Significantly, 
Uh, on one day, China commissioned three warships. I'd love to see that in Australia. One is an aircraft carrier. Another one is uh, LHD. And the third one is a SSBN. So there are three kind of messages that um, you can read. Uh, LHD is, I can project my forces to do whatever I want, simply uh, going into Taiwan. I can protect that LHD with an aircraft carrier. And if you piss me off, I will nuke you with SSBN from uh, the deep blue sea. So that kind of um, cold war between the uh, US and China is happening, and it's happening in our neighborhood. So what can we do about that? Um, we'd better be ready. When you look in terms of Navy assets, what China can throw into the mix, you've got, um, in terms of submarines, the whole suite. You've got the inheritance from the Soviet era with submarines that were designed and built in Russia to submarines that were designed in Russia and built in China. And now we've got both SSKs and SSXNs that are designed and built in China. We've got now in front of us, at least from what we know, because it's super hard to know what's happening in China, 57 submarines that can be um, thrown at us. So let's say 50 SSNs. You have to remember that 50 is a magical number by the US Congress in terms of fast attack submarines that the US Navy has to go um, to get as a minimum. So that's the magical threshold. So we can see that uh, China is challenging the US Navy in terms of capability. The one difference is that in the US Navy, you've got 11 aircraft carriers, whereas in China, you've got two that are um, in service and one being in um, commission. So that may be the, uh, the, um, the, the parameter that is still uh, constraining China in terms of ambition and operations at sea. But this is happening. This is happening on the submarines. Uh, thanks to Google Earth, you can have a, a good uh, perspective on what's happening in China. Uh, you can see uh, from last year, SSBN uh, being built in the Huludao uh, shipyard, a Shang class SSN in July being commissioned. And in terms of conventional submarines at the bottom, you can see the Type 39C, which has definitely taken some inspiration from the A26 Blakinia class from Sweden, and even a, a very weird uh, looking sailless SSK that has been seen and spotted sailing uh, in one of the rivers of, of China. And it's a big baby, this one. So things are happening. What about us? What do we do? Uh, this map on the right hand side is uh, what we usually have from uh, what we call the state of the union uh, that uh, the Royal Australian Navy is, is sharing publicly uh, during the Submarine Institute of Australia conferences or such events. And as you can see, uh, both yellow spots on the right hand side are where we have sent our submarines. And it is a fair bit of travel to get there. Uh, especially if you assume that we've got a, a mixed transit speed of maximum 10 knots, it's basically three to four weeks to get to some um, places. So yeah, uh, the need for speed is definitely there. And with the SSN going at 20 knots, you could basically divide it by half uh, the time to, to get to those uh, places, but not New Zealand. They don't want us to get there with uh, SSNs, but that, that's okay. So that's our response. We say we want the speed of the SSNs, the nuclear attack submarines. Um, we want to make sure that we keep the stealth as low as uh, SSK on batteries. And with SSNs, we have the advantage of carrying more weapons. I'm sure that most of you are already familiar with uh, those uh, characteristics. In terms of size, uh, biggest, SSKs are around 4,000 tons, and attack was meant to be around that uh, mark of 4,500 tons. 
The smallest SSNs are around 2,700 tons, but the biggest ones can be as heavy as 10,000 tons. So that's the, the landscape. This is a pathway. Sorry. So as you uh, may know, we will have um, a submarine rotational force of US and uh, UK submarines going into the west uh, or based into the west uh, for some um, stays as early as 20, uh, 27. We've uh, potentially run crew members uh, getting trained um, on this. The following big step will be the uh, procurement of Virginia class SSNs from the US in the early 2030s. And we will explore a little bit what that could mean. And then the following big step, so the big shiny thing that uh, is uh, the carrot for South Australia in particular, is the uh, build of the uh, SSN AUKUS from a British or joint British uh, US or Australian design in the early um, 2040s, uh, with between now and then uh, the build of the shipyard in South Australia. And once again, we'll have a lot of cat that. The one thing that we have for sure right now is the Collins class submarines that will all undergo a life of tap extension. So that basically from 2026, Fancom will be the first one to have a, a life of tap extension and uh, to have 10 more years of active duty up to 2038. So to get there, that's the stewardship pathway. We need to be uh, sovereign ready by uh, 2033. And we will try to explain or understand what does that mean. So what does that mean to get that nuclear qualification uh, process? To be very uh, blunt, we've got three tiers in terms of nuclear qualification. You have to be nuclear aware if you are a worker working in that nuclear shipyard, but not having some direct um, involvement into the nuclear systems. So basically it's to be aware so that you don't do any silly things. Then you've got a second tier where you are nuclear capable and you will be entitled to either operate or intervene for maintenance on nuclear systems. And then the final tier is that people that do brief and leave nuclear, such as, such as the nuclear engineers, the chief engineers that are in charge of uh, really being the expert and enforcing the policy and making sure that um, things are kept uh, under control and on track. So how do we get this kind of qualifications? A rough, rough rule of thumb at a minimum, if you look from a pure Navy perspective, for one nuclear reactor, you would need at least 50 non-commissioned officers and sellers to be with that uh, qualification of nuclear qualified for operations. And you will have the officers and obviously the commanding officer as well. In Australia, our commanding officers will have to get a complete qualification on nuclear engineering. Okay, that can be a challenge because not all our commanding officers had a bachelor degree in, in, in engineering. There are some bachelor of arts or things like that. And that will be a showstopper for them if they want to be commanding officers of uh, SSNs. In terms of industry, we will have uh, our blue colors, our technicians and our uh, engineers that uh, will have their basic qualifications in their field of expertise, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, chemical engineering, whatever. But they will all need on top of this one, two or four years to get some additional training. That additional training would need to cover nuclear propulsion, nuclear stewardship for Australian naval infrastructure, they would need also to be trained on simulators and most definitely on the land-based uh, reactor, hopefully in Australia, and they would need 
to get some training at sea, especially for the uh, crew members. That does take between 10 to 15 years, especially if you want to be the commanding officer. It's not going to be less than that. So you need to start now if you want to be that commanding uh, officer on uh, SSM. And that training needs to happen on uh, platforms, so not as old as the Los Angeles and, and the T-Boats from UK, but things that would be relevant. So hopefully the Virginia class submarines. Let's have a little talk about the technology of uh, the reactors, uh, because I know that most of you are interested in those technical terms. When we talk about British and US uh, submarines, we are using the high enriched uranium or HEU as a nuclear fuel. Uh, that is the, the concern for the non proliferation treaty. That uh, is basically what China is throwing uh, at us. Why this technology? This technology is basically giving the ability to the submarines of not being refueled. So when you look at the Los Angeles class, the flight one needed refuel, but then from the flight two onward, we've improved the Los Angeles class, there was no need for refuel. There are a few exceptions though, and we will explore that with the transition um, for the Virginia class. When you had a refueling operation, an ERO, that was taking up to 31 months in the US, and now it's down to 24 months. And uh, in 2023, this year, uh, the USS Chinese, so the last of um, the improved Los Angeles class, is going to get a 10 year life extension to get refueled. And I will show you why, in the following slides, this is uh, needed. For the other Los Angeles class submarines, it's a based on a HAD hoc basis for the three year extension. Why? And once again, I will go into further details later because the US Navy has to get a minimum of 50 SSNs at sea. And with the Virginia class, submarines do not need refueling and they have a life expectancy around 35 years. On the other hand, just for uh, mentioning it, the low enriched uranium, which is still a possibility that the US Congress is uh, considering, can provide the same power. But uh, low enriched uranium means that you have, uh, instead of 90 plus percent, you have below 20 percent of uh, enriched uranium. So you, the mix is about the ratio about uranium 235 versus 238. So that's the mix of uranium 235 that we are interested in. And it's um, non proliferation treaty compliant, but you have to refill every 10 years. That can be seen as an advantage. If, depending on some regulatory framework, you need to inspect the pressure vessels, such as um, what the uh, European Union is asking for all pressure vessels. The so refueling takes uh, roughly five months on uh, the French uh, SSN, so it's not on the critical path of the FCD. Obviously, that's something that is deeply ingrained into the design of a submarine by the use of what you can see as the bottom right, uh, which is a soft patch to easily access uh, the nuclear uh, reactor. But that's not the path on which we are. Just be aware that that does exist. And maybe in the future, if the SSN for the, from the US were to go on the LU, maybe that's a path that we could uh, consider. In the meantime, we are really at square one and, and we need to maybe take some inspiration from the different milestones that the uh, IAEA is recommending for a nation to be nuclear ready and to be an operator, a safe operator of nuclear power plants, whether they are land-based for power generation or at sea for submarine um, in the Navy. The first phase is definitely around uh, people, the HR strategy and the workforce, the education. I'll be very, very specific there in the Australian context. Coming from someone working at the university, my, um, my bread and butter activities are to train people. But let me be very clear. 
I'm happy to train everyone in nuclear engineering uh, for submarines uh, from next year onward. But what would be the point if these people don't get to practice uh, and to use their knowledge and their newly acquired skill into a practical context? So I'm happy to bang my chest and say, yeah, I can do it. Universities in Australia can do it. The UNSW has got a great program in nuclear engineering. But what is the point to train if we are just training people that cannot use straight away those skills? Because it's going to take a lot of time to, to get there. The following steps, phase two and phase three, are focused on the regulatory framework in which we need to operate to be basically um, safely managing the nuclear uh, assets before the phase four, which is basically when we are ready to uh, run the commercial operations and to run the actual uh, reactors. So you see, we go from the people with the regulatory framework to the physical assets. So that is the, the pathway. How can we get there? And what is going to happen between now and then? So with the Collins Life of Tap extension, we have a bit of time. So to avoid the capability gap. So with the 10 years, we will have submarines that will be for planned uh, decommissioning as early as 2038. And these submarines will be in their 40s when they are uh, decommissioned. And the assumption is that before we've got both submarines decommissioned, we will have at least three to five Virginia classes. So we would assume that when we get Virginia classes, Virginia class submarines in the early 2030s, the first three will be replacing Fancom, Collins, and the Waller. And from where we are, or where we were in 2022, having basically some submarine flying the white unseen uh, SSN AUKUS in the early 2040s, I meaning we've got 20 years. 20 years to do what? 20 years to build the shipyard and to build the submarine. So how does that compare to what the US and the UK did for their uh, submarines? In the US, a Virginia class submarine, when you are um, in production, is roughly 61 months to produce uh, at uh, electric boat or uh, Huntington in girls industry, a Virginia class submarine. In the UK, realistically, the first astute class took 114 months. So that gives us a kind of benchmark about you know, um, what we could do or what we should expect uh, in terms of duration. Obviously, there is a steep learning curve. And there are also, uh, especially in Europe, some financial constraints that can slow down the uh, industry compared to what the shipyard could actually uh, deliver. So if we assume that we will take 10 years to be the first of class from, for the AUKUS SSS, uh, we need to have a production ready milestone, the shipyard, everything in place in 10 years from now. Can we do it? What have we done in the past? And what capability would we have if there are some delays? So how did that happen in those uh, friendly countries that transition from SSKs to SSNs as we want to do it. Uh, you will recognize Hyman Recover here in the US and countries nowadays that are only with nuclear power submarines are the US, the UK and France. And that's our aspiration to become a SSN only country. But before that, these countries had a mix between SSKs and SSNs and other countries such as China, Russia, India, and later on Brazil and us will have a mix of SSN and SSKs. All the rest, they've got SSKs only and they're happy with that. Interestingly, it took US, the US, the UK and France more than 30 years to do the transition from SSKs and SSNs to SSNs only. And our ambition is to do that in a much shorter period of time. So what 
does that mean? And can we do it? When we look at um, our pace in defense, especially in submarine programs, and when we compare ourselves to countries such as Korea, we are much slower. Uh, you can see that if I put on those two um, pictures, the last three generations of uh, submarines, South Korea went twice as fast compared to us from, to go from uh, one generation to a third generation of submarine. And for Australia, that was taking into account the attack class program when we're uh, building the submarine or intending to build both submarines. So now we have kicked the can down the road a bit further, meaning that it's gonna slow us even more. So that is the reality. We are quite slow in Australia to put things into motion. What would that mean for our submarines? This is a, a list of all the uh, active or recently active submarines uh, and their age. So you can see in orange, we've got the Collins class submarine, roughly 29 years, and they will be uh, extended. Uh, at the bottom, you will spot the two Taiwanese uh, submarines that are going to the uh, 70s, that were um, World War II submarines from the uh, US, Balao and Tench class, that are still operated by uh, Taiwan. And uh, recently, it was a couple of years ago, in Poland, they have um, decommissioned the OIP Bielik, uh, which was uh, in a um, 54, basically, when, uh, when the commission. So what does that show to us? Well, we can have submarines that are quite old, indeed. It's not a problem. Other navies have done it. There are obviously some caveats, some limitations in terms of operation, but that could still buy us some time. And the life of that extension uh, is basically the first step, hopefully the last step, to uh, buy us uh, time before we've got a new class of submarine going into uh, action. Some people ask me, should there be an interim SSK capability? And everyone would have an opinion. So I played a, a little game and uh, I put basically a list of contenders. And once again, that's an analysis that each of you could uh, run. What I've done, I put some criteria. The first criteria was the capability to meet the current Australian future submarine requirements. The second criteria was how mature the design can be. The third one was, can we do that with modern tools? Okay, we are no longer using some blueprints. We are using modern tools and CAD and everything is on computers you know, these days. Is there any issue with obsolete technology in these submarines? Can we integrate a US combat system? And is there an Australian industry capability plan to build locally? So I put some grades from one, which is the poorest, to four, which is the highest for all these contenders. Very briefly, for the FS requirements, because the ATA class was specifically made for the Australian requirements, she's got the highest uh, grade. The son of Collins could have been an adaptation coming second, Collins being in use coming in third, and the rest uh, not being tailored to the Australian requirement has the lowest grade. In terms of design maturity, Collins does exist, so it's mature. Um, a son of Collins does not uh, exist, so lowest maturity. Uh, the attack class has only a low grade because they were only at system design, not at detailed design to be uh, manufactured. In terms of capability to manufacture those submarines with modern tools, Collins uh, was done in a different era, uh, whereas the submarines such as Scorpion, uh, the uh, SAT Plus, or uh, 
more recent submarines are done with modern tools. In terms of obsolescence, uh, Collins is a submarine done with technology of 20 years ago, especially for the platform system. So there are some obsolescence issues to, uh, to address. And other submarines that are more recent do tend uh, not to face the same challenges in terms of technological uh, obsolescence. For the US combat system, Collins and Son of Collins are basically the best um, contenders. The rest, we would see a strong opposition from the US to get something integrated on those submarines. The safety has a lot of the Yes, yeah. And I'm saying that because the US would not have a vested interest to let any other option uh, happening mm -hmm. because they won't basically say, no, you go with the Virginia class. So say they would say, no, we, we can't uh, allow to, that. but you are right, the SIT is um, on, uh, on the face of, of it with um, that combat system. But the US would say, yeah, no, we don't like that option. This is a stopgap option. This is not replacing the Virginia class. This is saying this is cover the gap in between Collins and... Yeah, and whatever would come after that. So it's, it's basically replacing Virginia class as... Yeah, could be replacing the Virginia class as well as a capability gap. So that's the political, uh, that's the political motivation rather than the technical uh, possibility. And something for the Australian industry capability plan, because there was one specifically uh, built for uh, Australia. So, so despite my uh, French accent, the attack class uh, would have been a logical or potential gap filler. Uh, benefits being we are still honing our skills uh, and I will come back to that uh, later with uh, the potential uh, scenarios. Now, in terms of middle term, uh, very quickly having a look at what's happening in other countries, Brazil is one of the country who is trying to, and who is currently building their own uh, SSNs. And uh, it's a long process for them. They started in uh, at least in 2006 uh, on their own with uh, some support of the French, but not on the nuclear uh, power part due to um, the enforcement of the non proliferation treaty uh, clause. So they expect to uh, start to build uh, the uh, Alvaro Alberto uh, in the late 2020s, uh, which is much later than the 2023 um, objective stated uh, above. But they already have uh, at the bottom right a section to test the auxiliary systems that will be supporting the nuclear uh, reactor. In India, they've got their own um, SSBNs, whereas in terms of SSNs, they are dependent on uh, Russia. And they had a lease of an Aquila class uh, submarine, ENS uh, Chakra, that was returned uh, to Russia in uh, 2021. And basically, uh, our very good friend uh, Vladimir Putin is uh, holding, uh, holding Narendra Modi by the balls because if uh, India says anything about Ukraine, then India can say goodbye uh, to their future SSN lease scheduled for 2025. So, you know, it's all about politics. Uh, in China, that's the uh, Bohai shipyard that we know that is being expanded for both SSBNs and uh, SSNs. I haven't checked more recently on Google Earth what was happening over there, but basically uh, they are launching between one and two submarines every year between SSBNs and uh, SSNs. So what do we do uh, in, uh, in Australia? We've got the shipyard, and that was the initial shipyard for uh, attack. And you can see that was really not practical uh, at all. Uh, there was no direct access to, um, to the sea. There was the, um, the pathway to go to the uh, ship lift that was basically going onto the BAE shipyard part uh, where the frigates will be. So that was not very uh, practical. That 
challenge is now enhanced by the fact that we've got some rings uh, that will be a bit uh, bigger. So when you compare Collins at the top left with uh, other submarines, and these ones are nuclear powered, you've got the comparison in length and you've got the comparison in diameter. So the small section here is actually uh, the diameter of the pressure for Collins. And then the other circles are the uh, diameter, the outer diameter of some rings. So you can look and compare Collins with uh, the smallest uh, SSN, that's uh, the French Ruby class, just for uh, a reference. Then you've got what uh, is a spring class equivalent in terms of displacement to the ATA class. And here we've got uh, the Virginia class, so block one to four, who um, are roughly 115 meter long, whereas the um, block five with the added section will be 140 meter long. So we don't know which block we will have. Presumably, that's my personal opinion, I think we'll have something which is not going to be the block five uh, in, uh, in Australia. For reference only, you've got the Yasen class from Russia, which is you know, the big SSN and uh, displacing more than uh, 13,000 tons. So absolutely massive beasts, double hull uh, class, double hull submarine. And we've got astute here from UK. So we've got seven astutes four uh, active and three being uh, built or um, commissioned. So that gives you an idea about the size of these assets and could assume that uh, in Australia, we will build a submarine whose size will be between uh, the uh, Astute class and uh, the uh, Virginia class. So something quite big, which will struggle if it were to be built in the initial shipyard as foreseen for the attack uh, class. But shipyard brings the topic about what we have done in six years. Remember, we were in 2016, there was the announcement about the winner of the competitive evaluation process, that was Naval Group of France. And at the same time, that they started to work on the design, they were meant, or we were meant with Australian naval infrastructure to develop the shipyard. Mm -hmm. So that was in 2016, and this is what we've got six years down the track. We can spot in terms of differences, but you've got what one building here, which is at the top right, uh, the CSPIF, CSPIF, Combat System Integration Platform uh, Facility, that was for Lockheed Martin. And we have uh, the skeleton, of a building here, which was the PLBTF for the platform land-based test facility where the energy propulsion system for ATTAC were meant to be tested. So the DG sets, the batteries, and the, uh, the shaft line and with the main motor. That building uh, is not finished and is meant to be smashed down. Whereas uh, the life of tap extension team from the Commonwealth and Collins have now moved into that CSPIF uh, building. For the rest of the shipyard, you can see some small dots that are the structural reinforcement because there is no concrete slab. And you know, it's from marshlands, so we need to have a floor that can sustain uh, the floor loading of uh, large submarines. And that is basically good going to be what uh, we expect to do next for the expanded shipyard that will span uh, much further to the north compared to uh, what we were meant to have for attack. So that's giving you an artist impression about that uh, shipyard. Uh, interestingly, we have one ship lift for Collins in the ASC precinct. We've got the common user facility that will be mostly used for the uh, Hunter class frigates. And you can see that uh, on that artist's view, the, uh, there will be a final integration hall over there with another ship lift and uh, some sort of uh, basin uh, over there. So that's gonna be massive. The 
just for reference, that part in the middle is a natural reserve, so that's, prote that's protected. So we will never hopefully step into our part, but that gives you an idea of the size of, of the shipyard. It's a mix of industry dedicated buildings and commonwealth building, and there will be also um, a massive car park uh, with a foot, uh, a pedestrian bridge that uh, is going to be just over uh, the, the railway here, because for people that are not familiar, Osborne sits in the northern suburbs of Adelaide, and it's, it's a fair bit to, uh, to get there. I'm looking at Phil here. It's about one hour to go from a, a decent place in Adelaide to uh, the wild, wild shipyard in, in the north. That's the shipyard in terms of people. We need people to go uh, in this shipyard. This graph here shows to you the number of people working in the UK in uh, the nuclear sector. And when I shave the part, which is the civilian part, we still have uh, more than 20,000 people uh, equivalent, FT, full-time equivalent, per year working in the sector. So that is for an objective of seven SSNs of the Astrid class in UK and uh, four SSBN, I'm looking at Phil, four SSBN in, uh, in, in UK, so 11 goals. So you can see we are talking big numbers. So I don't know how many SSNs we will have in Australia, but there should be a proportion uh, of, of that uh, to work in defense without having the benefits of a civilian sector uh, working in nuclear power plants in Australia. So we don't have that industry base that we could tap into to produce um, the uh, people working in defense. Unfortunately, other countries such as Brazil and India, they've got those nuclear facilities uh, on the civilian side they can tap into. When you look at Brazil, they've got nuclear power plants, they've got uh, simulators, they've got fuel processing plants, they've got uh, training um, reactors, and uh, they can support the whole spectrum of jobs into the civilian nuclear industry. We don't have that in Australia. So that's going to be a real challenge. The other issue is once we've got the Virginia class salaries, basically um, to quote some of our American friends that came recently to Adelaide from the Rand Corporation to tell us uh, what to expect, they said, Oh, basically, once you've got the Virginia class submarines, you are on your own. That's great, uh, because you can see that uh, in the US, uh, even if they are on their own, uh, they are still struggling, <clears throat> despite all the might, all the money, all the infrastructures that they've got in the US. The key objective that they want from the US Congress is to be able to launch two submarines per year, and they are struggling with that. So they are struggling in the build. They are also struggling in the maintenance with a shortage of spare parts for the maintenance of the Virginia class submarines. They are struggling on some technical issues. So we could imagine that if they've got some technical issues in the US, we may still have some technical issues in Australia, not because the technology is wrong, but because the environment in Australia is different. So different things could happen. Those of you that are familiar with uh, the Port River uh, know the wild fauna that we've got in the Port River. So there is no reason why um, some um, nasty Aussie beasts uh, could do some nasty things to our uh, US made submarines. There are also, always the risk of having some subcontractors that are not um, telling the truth. So it's fine for us to have the nuclear mindset, but we're going to inherit both that could be flawed due to some either defective parts or defective controls. So what I'm trying to say is that nothing is perfect anywhere in UK, in US, in France. There will be issues. The 
challenge for us is how to deal in Australia with these issues if we are on our own. I'm not going to reminisce about what happened with the Oberons that we were maintaining in Australia during the Falkland Wars, uh, the Falkland War, sorry. Uh, UK, they have had enough to deal uh, and they couldn't be everywhere despite um, being um, our uh, allies. So there are some issues. Let's, let's just think about what happened with COVID-19 that we're not in control of despite our um, goodwill and that may impact our ability to maintain the assets um, in Australia. Even in the US, you can see that at the end of the day, they are lagging behind in uh, maintenance. Uh, the iconic instance of that is the USS Boise, who has been waiting to go into a full cycle docking for the past six years. So just imagine that if it were to happen in Australia. Now, let's talk about our shipbuilding industry. We had the Nara shipbuilding plan, we had the Defense Industrial Capability Plan, and in those days, we were meant to have a sovereign Australian naval shipbuilding enterprise to be delivered. Today, there is a complete reset. What is the plan for the SSN capability? What is the role of the Australian industry? What would be uh, the shipyard in the West, in the East for the Navy base, and in South Australia? What would they look like? And please, please, I'm not going to tell you that we will have great opportunities in terms of Australian industry, especially for the small and medium enterprise, but they have to commit, they have to show their can-do attitude, because I think that most of them have been burnt with the attack program and that same speech. And to be honest, what space can have an Australian supplier with a Virginia-class submarine design built with US components, with the AUKUS submarines that will be designed and some of them built in the UK. What is the possibility to have a small part uh, of that? When the designers are going to tell to the Commonwealth, look, you can take someone from Australia to supply this pump, but you are also taking the risk. Whereas, you know, I'm in the US or in the UK, I've been working with that guy, that company in UK for the past 30 years. They have been delivering the same great technology on the Astrid class and on the Dreadnought. So what are the benefits? Try to tell me that the Commonwealth will say, no, no, I absolutely want an Australian industry capability. They won't do that. And the clock is ticking. So let's have a look. We have seen in the uh, public report about AUKUS that, I quote, this program will offer significant opportunities for small, medium, and large enterprises. Yes, for sure. To support the construction and sustainment of nuclear power submarines. They don't say if it's Virginia class or AUKUS class. So construction, definitely not a Virginia, which will boost Australia's technical capabilities and provide flow on benefits to related industries. I am sure they have hired people from marketing to, to do that. So we in Australia, we like, we love to build, build things. So we will build a massive shipyard. And I guess this is where the money is at first. You know, uh, go into civilian engineering, build a shipyard, pour some concrete, erect some buildings. That's where the money will be at first, especially in uh, South uh, Australia. Because in parallel, I will basically attract uh, your attention on that highlighted part. The growth of Australia's submarine delivery infrastructure will be supported and complemented by the existing infrastructure in the UK and US, which will be vital to the delivery of this program Australia will make a proportionate financial investment in the UK and in the US industrial base in order for them to meet the AUKUS requirements. What does that mean? I'm just a taxpayer and I'm gonna invest in the UK and uh, in the US. Okay. So I'm looking at some websites and in the US and basically, 
this is what I've, I've got. The in, undisclosed sum of investment will serve a few purposes. So the funds will add a significant number of trade workers to help address the significant overhaul backlog for the Virginia class submarine. Oh, that sounds like a great investment. Australian monies would also be used for advanced purchasing of components and materials that are known to be replacement items for submarine overalls and outsourcing less complex sustainment work for local contractors or to local contractors. Explain to me where is the investment and the return of our investment on this. Oh yes, the legislative proposal notes that Australian funds would be applied to recruitment, training, incentivizing and retention of key skilled, skilled trades, engineering and planning personnel in both nuclear and non-nuclear disciplines, blah, 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 blah. So we are going to pay people in the US to, hey, please stay and keep working for the US shipyards so that you are basically going to build some Virginia class submarines for the US. So that's, that's not my notion about uh, in, in investment. So I'm, I'm only an engineer, but I, I guess some people uh, in business will explain to me how this is a good um, way to invest my money as a, as a taxpayer, because that, that does evade me a little bit. And no, I'm not sarcastic at all. So let's focus on what we've got. Uh, a few questions. Uh, we are usually big on the Australian requirements. You know, uh, we've got our specific Australian environment. So how do we factor that in uh, the Virginia class that are already being built? Uh, can we have some schnitzel, schnitzel making machine on board? Yes, right. And the AUKUS SSNs, and what is the procurement process? Uh, how are we going to factor in the Australian legislative, regulatory, requirements, what are we going to do about the uh, unique Australian uh, equipment in terms of communications, cryptography, etc. How do we integrate that into both summaries? That's going to be interesting. And I'm not talking about the imperial system, but only the US, Liberia, and Myanmar are using it worldwide. So basically, you are telling me that we are just ditching uh, the Holy Bible which is uh, the defense capability acquisition process. You forget about this. You forget about all the uh, discussions, uh, you know, gate zero, gate one, gate two, first pass that we've got with XCASG and NSSG. That should have been discussed beforehand, but that should have been discussed with GM subs that was not involved or invited to discuss. And uh, all these things, to the best of my knowledge, have never been discussed. I'm not sure that there has ever been a consultation in parliament about AUKUS, but we're just talking about 368 billion, not a big deal. So the ASDEFCOM, which starts with requirements gathering. Yeah, by the way, forget about that. We're gonna go straight to the solution. We want some Virginia class summaries. If my students were to tell me, I don't know what you want in terms of requirement, but this is the solution that wouldn't go well. That would be an automatic fail. And I hope that that's not what we're gonna have. Uh, let's talk about value for money because you know, it's all about value for, for money. So uh, we are still, I'm still glad that we still have the ANO uh, in Australia as an independent entity. And when we look at what um, they found on the Hunter class program by our friends from BAE, uh, you can see that uh, there was absolutely no assessment about the value for money uh, in the three competing uh, designs. If you read uh, between the lines, they say that basically the best containers were the F100 from Spain and uh, the frame from uh, Italy, but the Type 26 came back as a black horse and uh, won the overall contract without exactly uh, that assessment in terms of value for money. And here we are a few years down the track with already 18 months of delay and uh, a budget uh, that uh, has got some cost overruns. 
and everything is fine in the great world of defense. I'm not talking about uh, the tiny little details about ITAR and foreign military sales that uh, some of you have been dreaming or that have kept you awake at night uh, for, for many years, but I'm sure we will find a way with our American friends about that. So let's explore the possible scenarios and the timelines for the great coming of the Virginia class and AUKUS when I will be either retired in my wheelchair or in the cemetery. Um, why? Because in Australia, we are the world champion in terms of uh, defense track record for the program delays. So this table gives you uh, the number of months for different programs, months uh, in terms of delays uh, in the implementation of these programs. Uh, Interestingly, the Air Force is not doing too bad. I'm very jealous. Uh, but for Navy and Army, uh, we are definitely uh, struggling a little bit. And I'm not pointing the finger at anyone. It's a collective failure of, uh, of us. Either it is a specific development program, a military or the shelf program, there are some, uh, some issues. So what I'm saying here is that we can expect some delays on the uh, tentative dates that have been announced by the Nuclear Submarine Task Force. So let's focus about the source of the Virginia class submarines. Let's assume that uh, the US, thanks to our great and my great investment in their shipyard, could, re uh, could retain the workers and could finally get to two Virginia class submarines launched per annum. That will give you here on that table the number of submarines active in the US Navy without any life of staff extension, without any tenure extension on the improved Los Angeles. Okay. It means that you can see that the numbers are dropping for the, uh, and they are dropping well below the magical threshold of 50 submarines in the US Navy, fast attack submarine uh, being available for the US Navy at any single point of time. So the trough is basically, interestingly, in the early 2030s when we are meant to have the Virginia class submarine. So how can we do that? Where is the magical wand to make it happen? We have to assume that uh, out of the remaining improved Los Angeles class that are in operation, all of them would have a 10 year extension to bring their life expectancy up to 45 years. Following the president, but hopefully USS Cheyenne uh, will establish this year after uh, the um, two years starting in 2023 of uh, engineering refuel overall to get that extra 10 year in um, under the bonnet. Despite that, you can see that there is still a drop. So we have the ability, uh, or the US will have the ability up to 2032 to be to keep the head above the water uh, with 51 submarines in, in service, but then there will be a trough. Unfortunately, that's when we say that we will have three <coughs> class submarines uh, getting uh, to uh, come to Australia. So the, the trough is as deep as 46. So even with three Virginia classes only coming to Australia, that will be done to 43. So there, there, there will be something to, to be done in the US uh, or a magical trick to remain above uh, the 50 um, SSNs in the uh, US Navy. That being said, if you look at 2031 with 53, you can still take three VGA class submarines out of the cycle and, uh, and sell them to, to Australia. The issue will be uh, after that. Okay, so my read is that for that, option to happen to have Virginia class submarines being uh, released to Australia. It means that the success of the life of tap extension for the Los Angeles 
improve Los Angeles class has to work. So that's that's already you know a, a big a big deal to make sure that this does work. Otherwise, uh, I, I don't think that the U.S. Congress will say, "Yeah, we we love uh, the OZs, but sorry, we we've got other priorities." And let's imagine that um, there is some serious shit happening in uh, the China uh, Taiwan uh, space between now and 2031. What could possibly go wrong for us? So these are my uh, burning questions. Number one, when the Commonwealth is telling us, uh, oh, you will have, we will have in Australia, uh, Virginia class submarines in the early 2030s. Uh, why is that so hard to put a bloody date, a bloody specific year into the program? When you look at uh, the Oculus pathway, the stewardship, ready is 2033. So basically that's the earliest from what we can see in the public report. But what I would love is to have a specific date. So these are three scenarios. The blue sky scenario, everything goes according to the plan. 2033, we are still watching ready and we can operate nuclear powered submarines. The gray sky scenario is things are taking a bit of time and it's not before 2038 or 2039, we've got the first Collins to be the commission, but we get our first Virginia class uh, summary. That still works because we've got then 52 SSNs in the US Navy. So we are past the trough. And see, in 2039, 52. So maybe that's the way out for the US, from the US Congress perspective, just wait to be, to be passed that trough. The black sky scenario, well, sorry, this is not happening. The US Congress doesn't want to play ball with us and we will just be nice with Australia and we will keep having uh, some US submarine based in, in the West and in the East as uh, Guam, Hawaii, you name it. So we'll just become a secondary base for um, the US uh, Navy. Burning question number two, why don't we have a specific date for the AUKUS SSNs being launched in Australia? The blue sky scenario, the early 2040s would be 2044. The first three Collins uh, being uh, decommissioned. We've got three VGA class submarines. Then, we are rolling over to keep our number of six submarines being available to the Navy. The gray sky scenario, where are things happening? And it's not before 2048, when we've got the last of the Collins being decommissioned, that we've got uh, the first SSN August launch. We would have then maybe five Virginia class submarines instead of three, just to wait for the first SSN August to be launched and that would be 2048 and from the US Congress 57 so we can take five of our VR class out of the US Navy but still works for the Congress. The black sky uh, scenario someone will say basically why should we bother having another class of SSNs in Australia and uh, indeed let's stick to the VGA class. And they will be operated either by Iran or the US Navy, or maybe we will build some VGA class submarines in the great new shipyard uh, built in, uh, in Adelaide, okay? Let's just use Occam's razor. Let's keep, in, let's keep things very, very simple. But then between the gray sky and the black sky scenario, there will be a fight about money between the US and UK, because this is where our taxpayers' money will go. BIE in UK say, hey, no, I need the bloody Aussie dollar, you know, in my pockets. I don't want that, that uh, pineapple to go into your pocket in the US. The burning question number three, who believes that the Royal Australian Navy will operate three different classes of submarines at the same time? We've never done that before. So the blue sky scenario is, yeah, we can do it. 
between 2044 and 2048. We'll have more three submarine classes in parallel. We'll, we'll have plenty of submariners uh, because we'll have bigger boats and we need to double the number of crew members uh, on a Virginia class submarine compared to Collins. And same thing with AUKUS. The gray sky scenario is, uh, well, 2048, just wait. So, but we have only two classes to manage. Now it's going to be complicated enough. Let's keep it simple. And the black sky scenario is, you know, let's keep things very, very simple. We just operate one class of submarines, and uh, that will be the Virginia class that will keep building in a, in a Adelaide, in Australia, uh, because we've been operating them, maintaining them in Western Australia, and why bother uh, with uh, August. SSNs. Now, the other question is, you know, what about sovereignty? So the sovereign capability in Australia, the definition we had in 2017 by uh, Admiral Summit was the sovereign capacity to build, operate, and sustain the future submarine. And I'm very happy with that definition. You know, we can build, operate, and sustain the future submarine. The current definition in 2023 from the uh, AUKUS nuclear force submarine pathway is the Australia has got the ability to become sovereign ready. I'd love to become sovereign ready to operate only so you can forget about build and the rest and own SSN as possible, as soon as possible. And the sovereign ready milestone, you can see the definition in that uh, blue box here. It's, you know, we've got the ability to safely own, operate, and maintain, et cetera, et cetera. So we are uh, responsible adults with whom um, you can play with nuclear SSNs. So you can forget about the industrial aspect. It's no longer uh, on the radar. It's, it's very sad because basically when you are operating a defense asset, you need the industry base to sustain it. So let's have a look at what we did in the past. We had, you know, the um, Collins class with a bit of design in Australia, but mostly supply chain and the build were finally done in Australia. That was very different compared to the uh, Oberon class. And with uh, the attack FSM, we were meant to increase that drastically. Well, you can forget about that. With the Virginia class program, we are going back to the Oberon situation. Both submarines designed and built overseas. The absolutely Zippo supply chain in Australia, and we will have to maintain them with an overseas supply chain. Good luck with that. That's going to be great. So everyone who worked and, and tried to sustain the Oberons knew the hell it was to get the parts uh, from uh, UK. So what could have been better? Okay, my stance, and you are not going to believe that coming from a guy born in France, was to do what uh, you did in, in the UK, Phil, with the hub order. Basically, you were at the same time developing the nuclear-powered uh, attack submarines, but you still had the hub order, and you built four hub order uh, SSKs. And my stance would be, well, we should have kept going on the attack class program, but not for the full span of 12 submarines, but just to give us enough time to build the plan, to implement the plan, to get to the SSNs, whilst we were still developing the local capability from an industry-based perspective to have our sovereign industrial capability, whilst we would be training the Royal Australian Navy crew members on SSNs, we would have developed in parallel the regulatory framework. And once we would have been ready to jump ships, literally, or to jump boats, then we would have told uh, our very good friends from um, Naval Group, okay, we stop at batch one, maybe four, the four first uh, attack class uh, SSKs, and now we are switching to the uh, SSNs. That's what happened with the Hubholder class after four instead of 12. 
Um, they were used for a number of years in the Royal Navy, then they were sold under the Victoria class name to, to Canada. And there was a transition from SSKs to SSNs in, uh, in the UK. That could have worked. Uh, the French would have been not super happy, uh, but at least they would have had something. So, conclusion, this is where we are. This is where we need to be doing things, develop people, develop uh, the workforce. But once again, there is no point training people if we can't use these people on meaningful tasks. The issue or the only advantage we've got compared to um, the other nations. So in the top left, you can see that uh, ranking uh, performed by uh, the Harvard University in terms of the complexity ranking, but the ability for country to develop complex products to export these products. So uh, constantly number one is Japan. And then I have listed all the nations with SSNs, the US and UK, number 10 and number 12, China and France, number 17 and 18, India, number 46, Russia, number 51, Brazil, number 60, and then Australia, number 91. So our ability from an industrial perspective to generate complex product is limited. What we've got is basically a GEP, which is equivalent to uh, those countries. I'm not obviously uh, comparing with China or uh, Japan, but India, Brazil, we've got uh, the same amount of money in our coffers to get into that uh, nuclear submarine uh, program. So that's where we are. Uh, we don't have any nuclear industry experience. We've got a limited complex industry. We've got a poor track record uh, in defense with a slow pace. Uh, once again, I'm not pointing my finger at everyone. It's a collective failure. We don't have any plan B. That's the worrying thing. We don't have any plan B. We basically threw the baby with the blast of water with attacks. So we, there is no plan B. And with the life of tap extension, that's plan A, B. I mean, we, we can't extend them forever. But you know, if we have to be uh, with uh, Taiwan competing for the oldest submarines in service, we can do that. The workforce is limited. We don't have a big budget. But uh, 368 billion, I guess, Phil, you can give me a, a check. Uh, that, uh, that will do nicely and it will be expensive. So, we're in Australia. I mean, seriously, we don't have to worry too much. She'll, uh, she'll be right. And uh, in the end, that's basically uh, what we are. We are the cash call for a number of uh, stakeholders. I just can't wait to fill in their buckets with uh, our milk, so to speak. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not targeting anyone here, or maybe I am indeed. 